a parable. I don't usually do that. And we'll eventually get to the scripture. But uh, I, had, I was thinking about this for a while. This is a parable related to what many of us have seen over the years. And it's been on the news a bit lately, talking about like uh, uh, product recalls and liability types of things, things like that. <clears throat> You know, there was even like a recent decision in the last couple of years about car airbags. Y'all remember seeing about that? About how they were, they were inflating so powerfully, even on a relatively minor accident, that the, the airbag was causing injury uh, even more than the accident itself. Uh, you know, medical companies all the time are having to, to defend their med medicines from claims of side effects uh, of injury, you know, uh, unless you happen to manufacture the vaccines, in which case you're exempt from all that stuff, right? But you know, medical companies have to weigh whether those side effects are, will cause more problems than what they're already trying to treat. You know, that's why all the commercials that we, we watch and we see about different medicines, they include all of those side effects as fast as they can possibly say them. To at least they can say that they warned you about these things. So, so some years ago, here's the, the kind of the parable, the analogy. Some years ago, a man designed a product and that he knew that it was going to change, it's going to re revolutionize the world. And he wanted to put it into mass production, you know, so he's, he's got this whole ability or this system of making this product. And in order to teach the, his workers how to make the product correctly, you know, he basically creates and designs a 10-step type of manufacturing process. And, and it works really well. Uh, so, you know, after, after a number of years of this product uh, being made and being successful, you know, uh, you know what happens all the time when you have a, a manufacturing place or some sort of company like that, you know, you get some, some new upstart college educated, you know, supervisor, manager, somebody who comes along and thinks that they know better, right? And they want to, they realize that they can change or improve the process. You know, he actually thinks that the original designer actually foolishly made it the process too difficult and too slow. And so he thinks he can improve the process better than the original. And in order to increase the speed and efficiency, he suggests that they actually remove a few steps. It's going to save time. It's going to save money. It's going to save some resources and things. It's going to increase the production, the number of things that he can make. And so the, the finished seven-step process, when, the, when they get done with the product of this seven-step process now, it actually doesn't look much different on the outside, really any significantly different on the outside than what the 10-step product, product would look like. Okay? Y'all with me so far? And so for the next few years, you know, the, the, the new seven-step manufacturing process is, is taught. And this new manager, I called him Maximilian for my daughter, uh, you know, he's right about this. The actual production numbers do go up. And the, the, he had been so successful, he'd actually bought, you know, 10 different manufacturing plants. And all but one of those plants decided to take on this new seven-step process. So, and sure enough, in those nine of those plants that had adopted this new process, they significantly increased, increased productivity. Their production numbers vastly outpace the one plant that was still sticking to the 10-step process. And so what do you think happened to Maximilian in all of that? Do you think he got a promotion? Of course he did. He gets promoted, you know, he gets made the president of the company, and he actually, it really bugs him that the, the one plant still is not taking up his new process. So he uses all of these improved numbers. He uses uh, all the new data to essentially shut down the one plant that's doing the, the old style, the 10-step process. And all of those employees are fired. And after a number of years or so, when every, all the new employees are trained in this new seven-step manufacturing process, no one even remembers that there was an old way of doing it at all. And over time, Maximilian retires. He's replaced by a new president and another and another. And more and more 
of the employees, every, everybody, nobody remembers that there was in any way, any other way of doing it. And all the while these productivity numbers are increasing, the product quality begins to do, decline. And more and more problems begin cropping up with the product. It's increasingly beginning to, to fail, to break, to cause accidents, to cause in, uh, injury. And what happens when that usually starts happening? Aren't there lawsuits of some kind, right? Once the lawsuits, lawsuits start showing up, then they have to start doing some kind of investigation. You know, uh, an overseer, a judge of some kind is put over the case. And in, in this analogy, this, uh, this parable, the, the judge realizes how big of a problem this is, and he decides to shut down production until the situation is resolved. And over the course of the investigation, somebody finds a history of the company and finds documents about that one facility that was, had been closed, but nobody even remembers that they used to have that one. And they find, when they're looking at this one facility, they find the original 10-step process. So in comparing the methods, it turns out that those three steps that were cut, six, seven, and eight, would actually have been preventing all of the failures of the product that they've been experiencing all along. There wouldn't be any lawsuits. There wouldn't be any injuries had they been using the 10-step process all along. And now the court has to try to figure out, who, well, who's at fault? Was there any malicious intent in the fact that they were doing this in the new way? You know, who should be held liable? You know, when you think about the timeline of things for a little bit, you have at the beginning, they were doing the 10 steps. And then they switched over and changed to the seven steps. There's a little overlap for a while. And the judge, you know, might be thinking to ask about these people down here. Or are these people down here at the end doing it wrong? If you ask them down there, if, hey guys, are you doing something wrong? What would they say? They'd say, no, we're, we're doing everything we've been shown. We were doing everything that we've been taught. We're following the seven steps, but are they in error? Yes. They are doing something that works to a degree, but it's not necessarily the ideal. It's not what it should be. And it's beginning to cause problems and injury. That's why production was shut down. So they may be in error, but are they at fault? That's a different kind of question, isn't it? For most of them, the answer to that would be no. They're not at fault because they're doing everything that they've been told. They're doing everything that they've been taught, everything they've ever been shown. Are they malicious about it? No. They're not doing it out of, out of intent. They're not trying to hurt people. They're not doing something deliberately. They're not intentionally rejecting the, the right way. They're doing what they were taught and the workers before them were taught. And from the first day they were hired, they were trained and taught the virtues of that seven step process. How it's speed, it's efficiency, how it revolutionized the company, company make it a worldwide type of thing. They didn't know of any other way. So is it, here's a question, is it possible to be wrong, to be in error, and yet not be at fault? Yes, that's possible. So where would the judge begin to look for and assign the fault? He wouldn't necessarily look down here. He'd start looking and focusing on what happened here, right? He would have to determine if the current generation of company executives, if they knew about this 10 step plan to determine any kind of malicious intent, he would have to say, Hey, we know that we've got this 10 step plan down here and we know that it works better than this one, but you know, we're still going to do this one because we get more product. They're having to determine whether or not they were intentionally doing it incorrectly or wrong, right? So did they know about that plan? Did they know it was which one was better? Did they know that it created problems or potential injury and just do it anyway? Or were they even just as duped as everybody else? So yes, they may have been told about it. Maybe they even knew there was such a plan. 
But you know that seven step plan is so much better, it's so much faster. They thought that the 10 step plan was a mess. They thought it would slow them down. They would never, would never become the company that they aspired to be if they stuck with that. So everything that they know about the 10 step plan is interpreted in light of what they were taught, what they believe about the seven. And again, it's hard to assign maliciousness on their part. Even if the executives can be in error, even the executives can be in error. Without being at fault, without intentionally causing fall, harm. You think of the fault, it would go to the ones who originally made the decision to change the production design. Again, the, the original decision back here. So yes, Maximilian was wrong to make the change, but maybe they thought it was you know, a genuinely necessary improvement. What if it could be shown that Maximilian made the change because Maybe he didn't, he didn't like the original designer very much or he, or the design and he changed it. Maybe he changed it out of spite, out of anger, out of resentment. Does that sound like it's malicious intent? Yeah, it does. That kind of changes how we approach this situation. And so if you're going to continue in the seven step process, you're actually continuing that original Frustration, that original malice, whether you even know it or not. Now, here's another thought. So the, the judge is finding out about all this stuff. And it, remember, he stopped the manufacturing before, and now he has to weigh all of this before he can come to this decision. And the more malicious the decisions have been, especially by the, you know, the current leadership, the greater the fault, the greater the penalty, the greater the liability. And then the judge has to decide whether the company can restart production. And if they can, which process is the judge going to make them use? What do you think? Is he going to make them use this one that was causing all the lawsuits in the first place? Depends on how much they pay him off. Yeah, that's, that's sadly far too true. Um, but if he was just going off the merits of the, the situation, if he was going to allow them to restart the process, does it make sense for him to say, well, you guys just keep on doing it the way you've been doing it? Or would he make them start production using the original design? I say all of that because it kind of leads to one of the common questions that we may hear when we come in this direction, in a messianic direction. You know, I've been looking at that over the summer, these common questions that we'll get, what we sometimes have to answer as, as from family members and from friends. You know, what made you go to the Sabbath or are you trying to be Jewish? Uh, as if there's something wrong with that. Uh, uh, why would you want to go back to being under the law? We talked about that a little while ago. Well, there is such a thing as the blessing. Uh, some of the questions of, well, isn't that considered or shouldn't that count as Judaizing? Or related to it, isn't, aren't you being a legalist? Right? How many of y'all have heard these questions at some point or another? Right? Um, and then, you know, away from some of the theological things, the questions may come and say, well, do you still love Jesus? Do you still love Yeshua at all? And then last week was, do you still love and teach the gospel? And what is the gospel? That's what we've been talking about. And today's question kind of comes from those workers at the plant who've been using the seven step process for a generation. Because they see the fact that at some point you and I have made a change, a change more in our practice of the faith the way of life of the faith than our necessarily our beliefs themselves. But when we try to explain those changes to our friends, to our family members, especially in the ones who raised us and the ones who taught us, maybe they would be in the position of some of those workers when the lawsuit was filed, who didn't even know there was another process. And so they would maybe ask the questions, are you saying all the previous generations were wrong? 
Have y'all, anybody been asked that question before? I have from several people. Are you saying, you know, all the, all of church history, all the things that have come before, are you saying all of those people were just terrible people, right? Or were wrong? Or are you saying that they were or we are not saved is really what it's often related to. Are you saying they weren't saved through all of that situation? And then in the best Hillary Clinton version of it, what difference does it make now? Now that we're here at this place, what difference does it make now? To them, the change that we have made really feels like a rejection of them. A rejection of what they taught us. And in some ways, again, that rejection of them. And not only that, to them it feels like a statement against even what they were taught. What their parents, their grandparents, and their parents had passed on to them. And that's a pretty tough pill to swallow, right? If it feels like, if it's coming across as a rejection of everything that they have taught you, that's a pretty tough pill because you're also saying something about what they were taught and what their parents were taught. You're abandoning essentially generational wisdom and understanding in their eyes. And in some ways, it's akin to the generation that, you know, transitioned from something like this, right? At one point or another, there was the generation that believed that Earth was the center of the system, right? Can you imagine how hard of a change that generation had to make to go to a, a sun-centered model. There would be a lot of conflict at those times. You're throwing off our entire understanding of the universe. There would be a lot of arguing. There would be a lot of questioning uh, of sayings like, you don't even understand science at all. And persecution, absolutely. It can feel like that big of a shift. A shift. It can feel like that kind of rejection. They're going to argue, how could these people, all of this collective wisdom, all this historic practice, how could that be wrong? Do you really think that you're so much smarter than all those that have come before you? Anybody heard that one before? I'm seeing some smiles and nods. Okay. They wonder whether you're accusing them. They wonder whether it's a salvation issue, right? So these are all legitimate questions. These are all legitimate concerns. But the problem for such a position, if you believe that where you're at is so ideal, if you, if you put you know, generation, generational wisdom in such a high place that no one is able, no one should even question, no one should even try to break from it, then realize that if you were alive back in the day, you would have been one of the people, one of those kind of even clergymen that were telling a man like Martin Luther to sit down and shut up. Stop asking questions. Stop challenging the Catholic Church stopped challenging the practice. They would, you would be accusing him of thinking too highly of his own intellect when he rejected centuries of teaching and thought. And that's really kind of ironic considering most of us have come out of a Protestant background, right? Most of us here have some kind of Protestant background. Protest is kind of in, in the name, right? And even though, you know, my opinion of Martin Luther has kind of gone down in recent years, considering uh, his anti-Semitism, he is an example of someone who made a break from the traditional beliefs of his day. And that is really hard. And it comes with a lot of criticism. It comes with a lot of backlash and persecution. But the questions, you know, that we're talking about today are, are addressing uh, are what were also said to him in various forms. Right? You following me? And hopefully I'm going to be a little nicer than he was in response. But if you, if you are still counted in a, if you're still considered, you know, in a Protestant church of any kind. And if you're talking to people who are still in a Protestant church and they're throwing some of these questions at you. And they say, you don't need to, you shouldn't be even asking these kind of questions. Then realize that. If you think it's wrong to ask those kind of questions or to challenge that kind of tradition, then they should 
have the consistency and integrity to quit the church that they're in and go back and join and convert to Catholicism. Because that's the same argument that's being made. Because generational wisdom and practice can be wrong, can't it? That's the way we've always done it. It does not mean something is true or correct, does it? So like in the parable, you know, those workers who were doing the seven step process, they were in error because of decisions that they weren't even a part of. They were, uh, they were in error because of decisions made generations previous. And the scriptures makes it clear that making a break, making a change can be a bad thing, right? It can be bad to, to switch it all up, but it can be a good thing. Let's start off with the, the bad example first. And let's look at 1 Kings just after Solomon when he died. 1 Kings chapter 11 says, So the days of Solomon's kingship in Jerusalem over all Israel was 40 years. Then Solomon slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of his father David, and his son Rehoboam was king in his place. And if you remember, it didn't take very long under Rehoboam's rule for the kingdom to do what? To split, to break up. You know, the ten northern tribes followed Jeroboam and were called Israel. The southern tribes remained in Jerusalem, were called Judah. That break happened around 930 B.C., generally. But Jeroboam wasn't exactly the smartest guy. Even though he was told by God, it's like, hey, continue in my ways and I will bless you. He instead made a break with tradition and practice, all for political gain. In chapter 12, verse 26, it says, Jeroboam said in his heart, <clears throat> This is what he's worried about. Now the kingdom may return to the house of David. That's what he wants to stop. If this people keep going up to offer sacrifices in the house of Adonai at Jerusalem, then the heart of these people will turn back to their Lord, to King Rehoboam of Judah. Then they will kill me and return to King Rehoboam of Judah. Now, a lot of people did this anyway. A lot of people left the northern kingdom and went down to join the southern kingdom. And so that's what he was worried about. So verse 28 says, So the king sought counsel and made two golden calves. That's always a great idea, right? To make golden calves to worship the Lord. That's worked out so well the first time, right? And he said to them, You've been going up to Jerusalem long enough. Here are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And then he set up one in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan. Now this thing became a sin for the people. This became a sin for the people went to worship before the one even up in Dan. He also made shrines on the high places and appointed priests from among the people who were not sons of Levi. It says, then Jeroboam instituted a festival in the eighth month and on the 15th day of the month, imitating the festival that is in Judah. He went up to the altar that he built in Bethel to sacrifice to the calves that he had made. He installed in Bethel the priests of the high places he had made. He made a break from his tradition. You consider the changes that he made and tell me if any of these seem familiar. So the changes made by Jeroboam, he changed the, the place, or the focal point, the city of worship. He took it away from Jerusalem. He changed the practice of worship and you know, made it essentially open idolatry. He installed a new priesthood. He even made new festivals and a new calendar. Right? He stopped his people from going to Jerusalem and he determined that he could they could worship God not based on what the Torah said, but where whatever he wanted. And he, just, he set up the places, the Dan and Bethel. He made those shrines over all those high places. He made two idols, these golden calves. Again, contrary to Torah, he put them there for the people to worship, telling them, these are actually, this is your gods who took you up out of Egypt. He's replacing, 
right? In making a new priesthood, you know, anybody could be a priest from any tribe. You know, that's a bigger kind of break from anything that Korah wanted to do in just changing his assignment. And in the new festivals, you know, it said that it was, he made it on the 15th day, but of the eighth month instead of the 15th day of the seventh month. And which, which feast is that we're talking about? That's talking about Sukkot. It was similar, but it was different. Does that pattern remind you of anything? The thing is that pattern established by Jeroboam continued for centuries. The northern kingdom came into effect in, again around 930 BC. It was finally destroyed by Assyria in about 722 BC. That's just over 200 years. Jeroboam's son Nadab became king after him. And he was measured as king by the actions of his father. In 1 Kings chapter 15, verse 25, it says, Now Nadab, son of Jeroboam, began to reign over Israel in the second year of King Asa of Judah, and he reigned over Jerusalem for two years. But he also did what was evil in Adonai's eyes. So that's, that's the Lord's assessment of this situation. He walked in the ways of his father and his sins that he caused Israel to commit. And the next king did the same. It says, in the third year of King Asa of Judah, Basa, son of Aijah, began to reign over all Israel in Tizra, <coughs> reigning for 24 years. And he did what was evil in Adonai's eyes and followed the way of Jeroboam and the sin that he had made Israel commit. Future kings of Israel. Do you think this was a pattern that kept going? Yeah. In verse 29, in the 38th year of King Asa of Judah, Ahab son of Omri began to reign over Israel. And Ahab son of Omri reigned over Israel in Samaria for 22 years. But Ahab son of Omri did what was evil in, the, in Adonai's eyes, more than all who were before him. It says now as if it was a now as if it was a trifling thing to walk in the sins of Jeroboam son of Nebat, he also took his wife Jezebel, the daughter of King Ethbaal of the Sidonians, and went and served Hello, sorry, y'all need to see that too, right? Uh, served Baal and worshipped him. It says he also erected an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he had built in Samaria. Also Ahab made the Asherah pole. So Ahab did yet more to provoke Adonai, the God of Israel, than all the kings of Israel who were before him. So he was continuing a new way of doing things, wasn't he? And those kings were measured by whether they continued in the sin, the original sin of Jeroboam. Whether they continued in the same era, era the same idolatry, the same thing year after year after year and God would sometimes send people to them to try to get them to change like what happened in chapter 13 but they refused to do so but here's the thing things weren't all that much different in the southern kingdom of Judah either first Kings chapter 14 says Judah did what was evil in Adonai's eyes and they provoked him to jealousy with more than all that their forefathers had done with the sins that they had committed. They also built for themselves high places, sacred pillars, and asherah poles on every high hill and under every leafy tree. And there was also male cult prostitutes in the land. They did the same abominations as those of the nations that Adonai had driven out before the children of Israel. So in many ways, Judah was worse. Because, and what made it worse? Did they have the proper city? Yeah. Did they, they had the proper place and practice at the temple, didn't they? They hadn't broken away from that. They had the, even the proper priesthood. You'd think that they still had the proper scriptures, and yet they did evil in Adonai's sight. It says a man named Abijam became king after Rehoboam, and it was said of him that he walked in all the sins of his father, which he had done before him, and his heart was not wholly devoted to Adonai his God like the heart 
of his father David. Nevertheless, for David's sake, Adonai God, his God, gave him a lamp in Jerusalem, raising up his son after him and establishing him and establishing Jerusalem. Sorry. So he continued in this break from a faithful people of David and Solomon kind of just started the, the downward trend. But the fact that David was faithful saved them from experiencing the same fate as the northern kingdom. That was that promise given to David. The northern kingdom, again, lasted about 200 years. The southern kingdom lasted about 100 years longer before Babylon took over and later destroying the temple in 586. But when you think about it, does it really matter how long they did the error? I mean, what I mean is, did the length of time that they did something, that they went in this new direction, did the length of time, even multiple generations, did it ever make the sin of Jeroboam right in the eyes of God? Did it ever, well, you guys have been doing this for a long time, so it, I'm okay with it now. Did it ever come to that? No. It never did. And it wouldn't have mattered if they had had 2,000 years worth of history doing it. It wouldn't have mattered if everybody had forgotten the, any other way. Even if generations of people, smart people, good people, can be, still be wrong in the eyes of God. They can be in error, even in ignorance, even if they're doing just what they've been taught. And as in Judah, that can be the case even if they've got the right things in their proper place, in their proper city, the proper temple, the proper priesthood. We can be surrounded by truth on one hand and still be in error on the other. Can we not? Does it matter? Does God care that we are in error or not? Yes, he cares. In fact, he cares a lot. You know, speaking to the Samaritan woman at the well, Yeshua says, well, he says, an hour is coming, it is here now, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such people as his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Does he care whether we are worshiping in spirit and in truth? Yes, he does. Because the woman had just, they would just been having this conversation. She just finally figured out, that about this guy, something's different about this guy. She figured out that he was a prophet, right? She had said, sir, the woman tells him, I see that you are a prophet. But then she goes into one of these situations. You know, our fathers worshiped on this mountain. But you, you Jewish people, all say that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. That's the same issue. That's the same question that was a part of the divided kingdom a thousand years earlier, almost. Does God care? Yeshua tells her, woman, believe me. An hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. This is, a, this is not a statement that, oh, well, Jerusalem doesn't matter anymore. It's just that Jerusalem is going to be gone too. Your mountain is going to be destroyed by the Romans, and guess what? So will Jerusalem. But you worship what you do not know. You're worshiping even in ignorance, as best you know how. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. Again, an hour is coming. It's here now when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people as his worshipers. He is spirit. Those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The Father is seeking those kind of people to worship him who are led by the Spirit of God. Not like some people mean it today, which is just kind of anything and anything goes. Or this is how I feel in my spirit at the, any particular moment. But truly led by the Ruach HaKodesh, who, as Ezekiel 36 reminded us, we read this a little earlier, 
the, the Spirit of God causes us, those who have been given a new heart, those who have been given a heart of flesh, he causes us to do what? To walk in his laws and keep the Father's ways. And so if we are worshiping in the Spirit, it will always be consistent with his word. And it will always be consistent with his truth. And anything else is what? Anything else is error. And he desires to make us into that kind of people. He desires, desires to teach us and show us how to be that kind of people. And if we are looking for leadership, you know, if we're looking for direction or guidance, you know, from another place other than Jerusalem, another altar, if we're looking for another priesthood, if we're looking at another system of worship, if we're showing up for worship on another calendar with other festivals, we are not consistent with his spirit nor his truth. And the Father will seek to change that and free his people from that kind of error. And you see that kind of change. You see that kind of break. You see that kind of willingness from the heart of God to do that in a good way in the life of Josiah. In 2 Kings chapter 22, says, Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jedidah, daughter of Adiah, I'm probably butchering that, of Bosca, right? Now he, unlike everybody else, most of the people that came before him, he did what was right in the eyes of Adonai and walked in all the ways of his father David, and he turned not aside to the right or the left. And he is a break from what was recent history. He actually rejected his, the ways of his father and the ways of his grandfather. His grandfather was Manasseh. And he did what was evil in the Lord's eyes. He even included child sacrifice in that whole system. He ruled for 55 years. And his, his own father, Ammon, rather than doing what pleased God, followed the pattern of his father. If he did what was evil in Adonai's eyes, as his father Manasseh had done, and so he walked in all the ways that his father had walked in, and worshipped the idols that his father had worshipped, and bowed down to them. He actually, in doing so, abandoned Adonai entirely, the God of his fathers, and did not walk in the way of Adonai. That's the family, that's the situation that Josiah was born in. And Josiah rightly went against that even though I'm sure it was not easy. I'm sure it was hard at times. I'm sure he had opposition. I mean, he was only eight years old when he started at the time. I'm sure he had people asking him the same kind of questions. Well, are you saying your father and his father before him and the kings before them, are you saying they were all wrong? Yes. Yes, they were wrong. And scripture actually commends Josiah for being willing to take that stand and say it. Josiah is one of the few examples of a good king. He demonstrates the father's desire to right the ship and to correct the error. And how does the father do that? How does he accomplish that? He returns his people to his Torah. 2 Kings chapter 22 verse 8 says, Hilkiah, the, the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found a scroll of the Torah in the house of Adonai. So Hilkiah gave the scroll to Shaphan who read it. It goes on in verse 10. Shaphan the scribe also told the king, Josiah, saying, Hilkiah the Kohen has given me a scroll. Then the king, then Shaphan read it before the king. He was eight years old when he became king. And he had a heart for God. He was demonstrating that already. This was now 18 years later. He was 26 years old when this happens. When his heart was really confronted by God's Torah. And his heart re was revealed by how he responded. Verse 11 says, After the king heard the words of the Torah scroll, he tore his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah the Kohen, Ahikam son of Shaphan, Achbor son of Micaiah, Shaphan the scribe, and Asiah the king's servant, saying, 
All right, guys, we got to figure out what just happened. We got to figure out what we just heard. Because as much as I've been trying, Josiah, you know, he's, he's, he tore his clothes at hearing the words of the scroll. He's, as much as I've been trying to, to make a break and make a change from what I had been raised in, what I had been taught, what my father did, what his father did before him, as much as I had tried to make a change and do what was right in the eyes of the Lord, guys, it's a whole lot worse than what I thought. So he says, go and inquire of Adonai for me, for the people and for all Judah about the words this, of this scroll that was found. For great is the wrath of Adonai that is kindled against us, since our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do everything written here that concerns us. You know, they went and they spoke to Huldah the prophetess. And, and this is God's assessment of how Josiah responded to this situation. He says, to, she said to the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of Adonai, thus will you say to him, thus says Adonai, God of Israel, as for the words that you heard, because your heart was softened and you humbled yourself before Adonai when you heard what I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they should become a desolation and a curse. And because you have torn your clothes and wept before me, I also have heard you, declares Adonai. What did Josiah do in response to hearing the Torah? He then, he tore his clothes. He grieved, he mourned, he repented. And then he read and taught the Torah to the people and he led them to change. You'll see all those things that were still lingering, all those things that were hanging around in the temple that didn't belong, all those pagan practices, including things done by Jeroboam, he sought to change. And at this point, turn in your Bible, because this is a long passage. I want to read 2 Kings chapter 23, verses 1 through 25. 2 Kings chapter 23 says, Then the king sent for, and they gathered all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem to him. The king went up to the house of Adonai, and all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him. The Kohanim and the prophets, all the people, young and old, and he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, which was found in the house of Adonai. So he, you, I had to listen to it. Now I'm going to make you listen to it. Then the king stood by the pillar and cut a covenant before Adonai to follow Adonai, to keep his mitzvot, his commands, his laws, and his decrees with all their heart and soul in order to fulfill the words of this covenant that were written in this scroll. And so all the people stood for the covenant. Then the king commanded Hilkiah, the Kohen Gadol, the Kohanim, and the second of the second order, and the doorkeepers to bring out of the temple of Adonai all the vessels made for Baal and Asherah. Can you believe those things were in there? In the first place. Who put those things in there in the first place? Who thought that was a good idea in the first place? And all the host of heaven, and he burned them outside Jerusalem in the fields of Kidron. He took their ashes to Bethel. He stopped the idolatrous priests whom the kings of Judah had ordained from burning incense on the high places in the towns of Judah and around Jerusalem, as well as uh, as well those burning incense to Baal, the sun, the moon, the constellations, and to all the host of heaven. Then he brought out uh, the Asherah pole from the house of Adonai to the Kidron Valley outside Jerusalem. He burned it in the Kidron Valley, ground it into the dust, and threw the, its dust over the graves of the common people. And then he tore down the quarters of the male cult prostitutes that had been in the house of Adonai, who thought that was a good idea? Where the women had been weaving coverings for the Asherah. Then he brought all the priests from the towns of Judah and defiled the high places where the priests had burned incense from Geba to Beersheba. He also broke down the high places of the gates that were at the entrance of the gate of Joshua, the city governor, which were on one's left and as one entered the city gate. Nevertheless, the priests of the high places did not go up to the altar of Adonai in Jerusalem, but they did eat the matzo with their kinsmen. Next, he defiled the Topheth, which is in the Ben-Hinnom Valley, 
so that no one might make his son or daughter pass through the fire for Molech. Then he did away with the horses that the kings of Judah had dedicated to the sun at the entrance of the house of Adonai in the colonnades by the chamber of the officer uh, Nathan Melech, as he, and he burned the chariots of the sun with fire. You noticing a pattern here? I mean, he's, he's cleaning out a lot of junk, isn't he? The king also tore down the altars made by the kings of Judah on the roof, the upper chamber of Ahaz, on the altars of Manasseh, and he made the, in the two courtyards of the house of Adonai. He smashed them suddenly there and threw their dust into the Kidron Valley. The king also desecrated the shrines facing Jerusalem to the south, south of the Mount of Destruction, which King Solomon of Israel had built for Asherah. Asherah, there's a wise guy for you. The abomination of the Zidonians, the, for Shemosh, of the abomination of Moab, and for Milcom, the ab abomination of the Ammonites. He smashed the pillars and cut down the Asherah poles and filled their places with human bones. You know, Solomon's a pretty smart guy, right? He's supposed to be one of the wisest in history. Does that mean he did everything right? Clearly not. Going on. Moreover, the altar that was at Bethel, and the shrine built by Jeroboam, son of Nebath, who caused Israel to sin. He's moving up into that territory. And the, that altar and that shrine he demolished too. He burned the shrine and ground it to dust and burned up the Asherah. Then as Josiah looked around and he saw the burial caves well, there on the mountain. Well, I'm going to stop that. Um, verse 19 Josiah said he, Josiah also removed all the shrines of the high places that the kings of Israel had built in the towns of Samaria to provoke. He did to them just as he had done in Bethel. All the, the priests of the high places there he slaughtered on the altars and burned human bones on them. Then he returned to Jerusalem. Then, after all that, the king commanded all the people, saying, Celebrate the Passover to Adonai your God, as it is written in the book of the covenant. So this was apparently something new. For no Passover like this had been celebrated from the days of the judges who judged Israel, or in all the days of the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah. But in the eighteenth year of King Josiah, this Passover was observed for Adonai in Jerusalem. More, that's, that's, that's enough for right now. But you're getting an indication. Was this a pretty big break and change from tradition? Yes. In doing all of that, was he saying that those previous kings and those things, those people were wrong in doing those things? Yes. He was saying that. He returned his people and his nation to the right way. Essentially from that seven step process assembly back to the original 10 step. He made a break to return to God's ways. And you can bet that not everybody liked it. Not everybody understood it. Not everybody even agreed with it. And if you're hearing this and you can hear some of the questions and some of the arguments and some of the things that people might say to us. You know, well, 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 we're not Jewish. Why are we worried about that stuff? That's where I'd say go back to look at one of the previous messages on that. If you're objecting, saying, well, you know, my parents and grandparents and their parents weren't going to a golden calf, right? They, they still loved Jesus, and that may very well be true. You know, the point is, one thing I want to say is they don't answer to me. I do not pronounce anything over anybody. I cannot and do not even try to judge their salvation and their status before God. Our trouble is what are we doing in our day? We can't worry about where it's been and what has been done in the past. Our trouble is what are we going to do about things today with things that have been going on for so long that we don't even know that we're supposed to do it a different way. We tend to justify ourselves. We tend to raise up all those things that we may be doing and thinking and believing right 
You know, the things that we believe, like by grace through faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Yeshua, we, those things like sola scriptura or the deity of Christ, we tend to raise up those things to justify ourselves, but we also tend to do what? We tend to downplay we tend to, we've been taught essentially to minimize, not really think about those things that we may have wrong. How the practice of what we do and those things are wrong. I mean, do we still have a lot of these same problems? Do we really look to Jerusalem for anything beyond the end time stuff? Have we built our altars, our shrines all over the place and think nothing of it? Do we continue with our our own figuring out our own way of worship and don't really think about what God calls us to do? Do we continue with our own priesthood? You know, anybody who, who feels like it can serve as a pastor or teacher with no regard for biblical qualifications or disqualifications? We elevate what we've always done as if that makes it true or makes it good. We've created our own calendar with our own festivals. We sprinkle the name of Jesus on top of it as if that makes it pleasing in God's eyes. And didn't Jeroboam try to do that exact same thing? These are your gods, these golden calves. Come here now on the, in the eighth, eighth month on the 15th day. He thought, he tried to convince everybody that he was doing, was approved by God. It was the same God who brought them out of Egypt. But, but did God buy that? No. God did not buy that. He did not accept it. And so while we may not follow exactly the sins uh, of Jeroboam you know, over the centuries, whether Catholic or Protestant, are we making a lot of the same kind of errors? Yeah, we are. Not intentionally in most cases, because, but because we've been so far removed from the truth that we don't even recognize the error anymore. And we have to realize that it's okay to say that, you know, Previous generations got some things wrong. We say that about, you know, doctors from the 1800s, right? Who didn't know, didn't even know to wash their hands before going between patients, between working on the dead and then going to help a woman give birth. We're okay saying that they were wrong in doing that. Were they in error? Sure. Were they bad people? No. It's not saying that at all. People in previous generations, were they not saved? Were they in so much error that they couldn't be saved? I'm not willing to say that. I'm not willing to say that at all. I was saved in a traditional church. And he has moved me a long way. Most of us can say the same thing. I sure hope, let's put it this way, I sure hope that even in error that we, I sure hope that that standard is not having all my theology correct in order to be saved. What's the standard? The standard is faith in Messiah. Trusting in what he has given, what he has provided. It's not having all of your theology correct because guess what? I still don't and neither do you. See, we believe God and his provision and it becomes credited to us as righteousness. Because again, I hate to break it to you, we're not doing everything right either. It's when Messiah comes and he explains everything to us. He's going to explain some things and he is going to correct some things even in what we're doing here. Y'all with me? You agree with me? See, none of this is because we think we're smarter. At least you shouldn't think that. It's not because they're dumb and you're smart. It's that recent generations are being confronted by God's word in ways that are very similar to what was going on with Josiah. With all the Jewish people coming to faith in Messiah in the last 60 years or so, it's as if the Torah has been rediscovered for a generation. For the first time, we are hearing it explained to us for the first time. And now is that appointed time. Now is that day for the eyes of the Gentiles to be open to his Torah. Because we've been missing it. 
for a very long time. And that's the same way, just as the eyes of the Jewish people are increasingly being opened for Yeshua as Messiah. See, we're both, we both needed our eyes opened on some things, didn't we? We both needed that. And none of this is because we're smarter. It's because we're being confronted by God's word. Because that willingness, or our, you know, we have to ask, are we willing, are we going to continue on when we are confronted by the Torah for the first time? Are we going to continue on life as normal, doing the same things that we've always done? Or are we going to tear our robes, tear our heart, and repent and change our ways? That's the heart of that, that is softened. That's the, the heart that is responsive to him. And that is the essence of the gospel. To make a break, to make a change from your old way of life, from the way that you were raised even, and change how you live. Romans chapter 12, he says, I urge you therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service. This is where he talks about the change. He says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may, be, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. See, we were here before. We were conformed to this world. It's in being confronted by the word of God that our lives are transformed and we can no longer live the same way. We are living in the days of correction. We are living in the days of that kind of fulfillment where now is the appointed time. This, we are now in that generation. And so we must pray that our hearts are ready to receive his correction. We have, must pray that we are ready to receive his explanation when he explains everything to us so that we may begin getting a little closer to worshiping him in spirit and in truth.